Hey guys, Chris Clothier here with the Grind Podcast. This week we are back with a podcast all about real estate investing. And this week it's actually all about some do's, some don'ts, a few little tips from a guy that's done it a few times um, on flipping houses made popular by HGTV and Discovery Channel and all the other channels that put out all the flip this house, flip that house, flip a house, flip you know, six houses, whatever, every little show that, that has been out there online, they made flipping houses, which is buying a home, doing a renovation and selling it in a short period of time. That's the definition of flipping a house. They made flipping houses sound easy. They made it look fun. They made it look like, man, there's nothing to it. They always made it look like there's this obstacle, but there's a way over it. And there's some professional from another city that's going to fly in and tell you what to fix and how to do it and all that goofy stuff that's out there. I can't tell you the number of times we got pitched shows and we almost did them. We're like um, using our own money. Like we front the money for somebody to flip a house and we kind of grade them on how good they do and got them through the process. Thank gosh we didn't do that because that would have been a disaster. Um, when I look back at, at today's podcast, what, what I'm talking about is, man, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. There's a lot of good and bad. There's a, there's, I mean, there's way more than one podcast. I'm going to tell you that right off the bat, but I'm going to pick a few of the top things to avoid and a few of the top things to maybe look for and maybe do if you want to, uh, quickly turn a house for a profit. So with that, Let's jump right into it, man. This is uh, Happy Friday. Hope you're having a fantastic weekend. If you're thinking about flipping houses, here's a pretty good place to get started. All right. So when I flipped my very first house, um, the house had something that I think every single property needs to have if you're going to be successful purchasing it, renovating it, selling it for a profit in a relatively short period of time. It had the ability for me to come in and do what's called value add. The particular property that we did the very first uh, fix and flip on was, it was in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Man, I cannot remember the name of the street it was on, but um, the house was a single story, three bedroom, two bath house, or one, it may have even been a one and a half. I think it's a three bedroom, one and a half bath house. But in Denver, for whatever reason, the time period these houses were built, it had a full basement. So it had a replica of the top floor and the bottom floor, but it was all open. There was no walls, nothing up downstairs. So that was an opportunity for us to do massive value add. What that means, there was all this space unused. We didn't have to pour concrete. We didn't have to pay for new dirt. We didn't have to do anything but finish out that basement, put walls up, seal it so that, you know, for a moisture barrier down there in the bottom, we had the, the pipes came from the, you know, the underneath the basement and they ran up, you know, to the, to the subfloor for the, for the first level of the house. So all of the plumbing was already there. All we had to do was turn the plumbing off and attach to it. Um, so we had the ability to very quickly take a Three bedroom, one and a bath, one and a half bath house, and turn it into a four bedroom, two and a half bath house with a bonus room downstairs. So all we did was add one bedroom, we added one bathroom, and we added one living space. But we doubled the square footage of the home. So we bought it with. You know, I, and let's, I'm going to round numbers. So I don't remember exactly what it was, but we bought it as a 1,200 square foot cracker box house. Very basic, nothing, you know, extraordinary about this house. It was just an ordinary, plain property. And we doubled the square footage. We took it and turned it into a 2,400 square foot house. We added an additional bedroom for a larger family. We added an additional bathroom for a larger family. We added a living space to give separation so you can have parents in one, one part and kids in another part. We really created what was a was a very nice family home, and we turned it into a much nicer family home. We added value to the property itself. Now, 
You hear all this stuff all the time, okay? And this is where we, this is right where we start deviating and getting off from value add and into, you know, uh, platitudes and all this, you know, sometimes advice that, that doesn't translate. Everybody says you fix the kitchen and you fix the master because that's where the wife or the mom is going to be attracted to. Sales techniques, okay, sure, get, I get it, whatever. For me, that's not what always adds value. That may be what somebody is looking for, so you don't ignore them. But that doesn't mean value add. You just because you put in new cabinets and new countertops and spruced up a kitchen doesn't mean you necessarily added value. Value is when you're able to squeeze a greater dollar, a greater you know amount out of the home because of the work you did. Can it, you know, if you buy a house that has the kitchen completely ripped out, has all the cabinets missing, and believe me, back in the foreclosure days, we saw that all the time. People were ripping out their own cabinets and selling them for what they could get for them. Really, really a sad time. But that we're not seeing that today. But if you happen to come across a property where there's no kitchen in it, and you can buy it based on the fact that there is no kitchen, it's been completely ripped out, that's a that's a tremendous value add opportunity because you're not paying for the existing kitchen. You're just paying for the square footage, the space. Now you're going to bring in something really nice. You know, we, um, value add sometimes gets confused with, I I took down walls. I opened up spaces. I made it a, a nice, better flow of a house that didn't add value. That's not value add. Value add is when you buy 1200 square feet, you turn it into 2400 square feet. You spent less per foot finishing it than what you can sell it per foot for in the end. So if you can sell a home for $100 a foot, but you can fix it for $50 a foot, you're going to make the delta. You're going to make the difference. If you added 1,000 feet at $50 a foot, that's $50,000 you make on that transaction. That's $50,000 you profit from because I spent X to make the 50. That is massive. That's what you're looking to do. That's called value add. And we were able to do that on the very first house we ever bought. Now, let's let's look at my second house I ever did. My second house, I made a ton of mistakes on. All right, so let me go through a list of, of don'ts. If you're going to partner, okay, make sure that everybody involved fully understands, fully buys in, you know, that the there's a there's a definition of who is doing what, what everybody brings to the equation, the value of what they're bringing to the equation and how this whole thing is going to work. And then finally, if you're going to partner with somebody, you decide on the front end how we break up. Because if you decide how I'm going to break up before I get started, then when a partnership needs to dissolve, we already have a framework to do it. You have to go into every, in my opinion, and this was this was advice given me by several different mentors, that you go into every partnership with a plan for breaking up. Because partnerships weren't always meant to last forever. Um, some were, most weren't. So, you know, during the time period that you're together, you know how you're going to operate. But what hardly ever gets discussed is how do we break up? How do we break this partnership apart? Um my partner and I did not have a plan for breaking up. And I'm telling you, this was a really, I mean, he's a great guy, still is today. Um, hard worker, genuine, as good as they come. But uh, he and I really failed to do our homework before we went into this second property. We bought a house that, um, when you looked at the comparable sales, these are comparable sales within three to four to six blocks at the most in any direction um, were really, really good. But there was a few comparables in there that weren't as good. And those few comparables also happened to be on the same street we were on. But within a couple of blocks, I mean, the prices really went through the roof. Um, We went and looked at the house. It was a super old house. And when we walked into it, we started trying to imagine the same thing we did with the first one. What's the value add proposition here? What can we come in and do to really bring a lot of value to this house? And when we looked at it, we were like, okay, we're going to like remove this garage and turn it into a bedroom. And then we'll add a, 
a living room here on the back plus another garage over here and we'll take this existing space and we'll transform it into that space and we'll take knock this wall out and we you know man we had these big massive grand plans of what we were going to do but ultimately in the end we weren't really adding much of anything we were just changing spaces around and we we built a house we got done with a house that went uh massively over budget massively over time budget i mean we we thought this would take us 90 days and we you know of course you talk to a contractor that has zero experience doing this that was a whole nother issue and uh you know he thought 90 days was a good time frame nine months later i mean the place is just a disaster he's making almost no progress whatsoever um and we ended up creating a disjointed, odd property. You know, it was it was weird how it was put together. Bedrooms were all split apart from one another. They nothing nothing flowed through the house. You had a you had a living room in one space with some bedrooms, and then you had like a walk through, and you go through a kitchen, and there's like a odd bathroom, and then you get to another living space with a you know it was just it was just weird. We did a really poor job. We added no value whatsoever. Um, did a ton of work outside to the yard, made it look like a park. I mean, it was beautiful, but we put it on the market to sell, you know, a year later and the comps by that time had held the comps still held. The problem was the comparables we were pulling from two, three, four blocks away. They were considered completely different homes in a different neighborhood. I think they may even had a different school district. So we really misjudged. We really missed the fact that we were on a line and we were right on the line where over there, that side of the line, you got, you got a lot of extra value for what you were buying over here on this part of the line. <laughs> no, you, the value isn't there. People aren't going to pay for it. Um, we were positioned directly across the street from a city park. We thought that was going to be a major boost. Instead, it, it ended up going the other way. People were like, I don't want to live over there. Because every once in a while, people gather at that park, and I don't want to be around people gathering at a park. You know, I don't want my kids playing over there when you got strangers gathering. You know, whatever it ended up being, it was just poorly thought out, poorly planned. So the negatives: we had no way to add value to this house. What we should have done was buy it, create everything new in it, put new systems in, new paint, create new flooring. You know, do do a very basic fix up. We should have bought and made money on the Delta that we bought it below value. We fixed it up. We sold it right at value and made a little bit of money. Instead, we bought it pretty close to full value, spent a ton of money and thought we could make a ton of money on the sale and not even close, not even close. Could we do that? I mean, we were this was going to be a massive, massive loss. It was going to take all the money plus some that we made on our first flip. So be aware be aware. Value add is the way you go if you want to fix and flip a house. You want to you want to be able to create if you can more square footage. Don't try and get all fancy with it. Don't try and, and do things outside the norm. You could really end up jacking up a job bad. When I go back to this this thing about partnerships and doing your your you know your due diligence and having your key information before you go in. Be careful that you have a way to break up your partnership before you get started if you're going to use a partner. Um, you know, ultimately in the end Everything, everything worked out fine, but it got to the point where neither one of us wanted to put any more money into it. We were just done. Um, the other thing that you should always be looking for is proper due diligence. You know, um, I harbor no ill will towards my old partner at all, but I was the one who had the money. He was the one who had the real estate license and could pull all the data. It's not his fault, okay? I, I'm responsible ultimately for the way I spend my money, but make sure that, that you really, really dig into the details. Everybody involved digs into the details because we should have recognized that a house over there is appraising for one dollar amount for a reason. Why is it so different? Why am I able to buy something so different over here? And why are there a few comps close to my house that don't support the same price that we think we're going to be able to get? Had we not made assumptions, had we really dug into details, we would have figured out that that this was not going to be something we were going to make money on. Um, and then the last thing is, is this, if you lack experience as a home flipper, you need to surround yourself with really experienced people, you know, tradespersons and real estate agents, that kind of thing. You need to have somebody in your camp that is an expert at, at what they're doing. We should have known 
the guy we were hiring, you know, our first fix and flip, the guy we hired, he went a little bit over budget, took a little bit longer than what we anticipated, but we made really good money on the house. Um, the guy drove just a regular old truck with a bunch of equipment in the back end, and we'd see some random person there helping him with the house. But it was it was really a DIY project. He was doing everything himself. You know, when we went to the bigger house, the bigger project, we should have known that was not the way to go. Um, be careful. You do get what you pay for. Sometimes cheap is not better, and sometimes more expensive isn't better. But more expensive um, with licensing with pulling permits, with having, uh, you know, uh, corporate vehicles, with having <laughs> multiple um, long time team members that work for a company, I mean, that, that create comfort because there's longevity, that's important. And it will become important the bigger the job becomes. So the mistakes we made were we went cheap, we didn't do our due diligence. We had a partnership that was destined to fail because neither one of us were knew how to hold the other accountable and how to make sure that the other one really knew what they were doing. All I brought to the table, to be very direct with you, was money. I brought money to the table. I was still super inexperienced when it came to real estate, and it showed. Since that time, I have done other fix and flips, but they've all been in Tennessee. And Buying houses here, I've really paid attention to, you know, I've done deals where I've blown out the back of a house. So I had to pay money for new concrete footings and new concrete putting a, uh, a, the flooring in, but I've added sunrooms. I've added, uh, I've taken like laundry rooms and turned them into bigger laundry rooms, but with a half bath attached to it to create a, a half bath in a room. I've removed in one one particular instance I re, you know I had this kitchen that just man it was crazy how just boxed in this kitchen was and I took all the walls down brought in some support beams and opened up made this free flowing kitchen into a living room and it had at the time it had a washroom in it the washer and dryer actually in the kitchen and I was able to move those two and build like a a in the garage build a laundry room so I just I had this big deep garage I brought it into a normal depth garage that a normal car could park in and brought that space into the house instead, created a washroom with a half bath. There's lots of ways to get super, super creative without getting crazy. I no longer try and turn you know, um, rooms into something that they're not. I did. I, I remember one, one other house I did where I, I walked into the front door of the house and there was a dining room and a formal living room in a relatively small house. It's only 1,500 square feet. Um, on the other side, you walked in and you walked into a kitchen and it had a living room. And then just beyond the living room, you had three bedrooms and two baths. And I kept walking through the house, walking through the house. And it was actually my younger brother, Brett, who gave me the idea. He's every time he walked in, he said, Chris, we need to close this wall in on this formal living room because no one uses a formal living room anymore. Not for what we're looking to do. Wall this in. Now put a door on the other side in the hallway where all the bedrooms are and create a fourth bedroom. Build a closet into it. Now you have a four-bedroom, two-bath house with a living room, a dining room, and a kitchen. We put a bar in the kitchen, so now the bar in the living room or the kitchen in the living room kind of became one space with a, it had an eat-in kitchen, it had a full dining room, it had a bar top that went into the dining went into the living room so now you had this very open living space but with four bedrooms um and it worked out perfectly it added value to the home that bedroom was much more valuable than an unused formal living room so that's what i look for now when i look at houses i look for that ability to bring value add i think you should do the same i would love to go back and and again find homes with unfinished basements that i could seal up double my square footage, uh, have that square footage heated and cooled and included in my next appraisal with my sale price. I think it's a that's one of the greatest opportunities for value add, I think, that exists out there. But that's, that's really what you're looking for. Uh, I've also done things, I'm sure you've heard the term, a pop in the top, where we take an existing square footage and we find a way to be able to build up. So the only thing I end up paying for is framing as I go up on a house. Um, and I've done that a couple of times where we've had a kind of an unused extra room that's upstairs 
you know, kind of odd walls, odd angles. It, it really was supposed to be an attic, but they ended up turning it into like an extra room type space. And we end up blowing the top up. So we end up putting full walls in. Uh, you bring the plumbing up from an existing bathroom that's down below it. You create a bathroom up on that upper floor along with a, a bedroom and a sitting area. And now all you paid for is the walls going up and the flooring, you know, but especially in a, in a scenario, and I've done this before, where you have to replace a roof, I'll just go up instead. My roofing costs are the same. I've created the same footprint of the house. I haven't changed the footprint, so the roofing is the same. But now I've got more bedrooms, more bathrooms. You know, that's value add. That's what you look for. That's how you find success um, with a fix and flip house. You don't do it by getting, you know, odd, like I told you on my deal a second ago. And lastly, to ensure your success, if you're going to have a partnership, do it. Absolutely have a partnership. Just make sure you know how it's going to end and you decide on the front end so that when when and if that, that time comes, you shake hands and say, all right, we're good. This is how we said we were always going to you know, split our partnership up. What do you think, Isabella? You ready to go flip a house? Well, always. All right. If y'all didn't hear that, she said always. I'm not, I'm not quite convinced, but I know that if she did it, she'd be successful. As I hope you are out there if you're listening to the podcast today or watching on YouTube. Look, don't forget to, to like our page, you know, download and subscribe to the Grind newsletter if you're not already there. Kent Clothier's executive letter comes out every other Sunday. Fantastic stories, anecdotes, you know, from his history, 55 years as an entrepreneur. I really appreciate you joining me every week for the, uh, the Grind podcast. I hope you're having a fantastic uh, end to your week. Have a great weekend. Guys, until we get a chance to talk again, commit to the Grind. We'll see you soon.